recertification. All right, on to our presenter for, for now, for the 11 o'clock hour. We've got the right guy. Walt Sanders, who is a certified detailer with the IDA and also skills validated. Walt started out as a porter at a local dealership. Porter means moving cars. Um, in 2006 and eventually worked his way up into detailing a couple of years later. In 2011, he started his own detailing company service, servicing local clients as well as dealership accounts. In 2013, he closed up shop and went back to the dealership as a detail shop manager, and he currently is still a manager. Wow, that's a, lot, that's a hard job. That's hard. That is a, yeah, very stressful. Uh, it's currently still a manager at a dealership detail department with a primary goal of creating a dealership detailing training program in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Walt Sanders.
you're going to have to buy all those tools where a lot of the dealerships now are purchasing that equipment and you can just use it and you don't have to worry about it. So that's a big plus. Um, Efficiency is another one. When you're on your own, you have to be efficient to make money. The problem is, is a lot of people will start out, and I did this as well when I had to buy a detail shop. I wasn't proficient at all. I was actually very slow. We, were, we started out doing about a car a half a day between the two of us, and it just wasn't bringing money. So when I went back to the, the dealership and we started doing the deal of work for them at our shop, we started getting more proficient. We started learning different tricks and things like that. Um, and it definitely made us faster, where I think if I stayed on my own, I wouldn't have had that experience. I would have just kept being slow, I kept being meticulous, using you know 50 different pads on one car, spending you know six hours on an interior. When if you guys know dealership work, that's not what they're looking for. That's not what they're going to pay you for. They're not going to pay you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to do this. Um, it can be very lucrative to work in a production shop, depending on the way you're paid. A lot of detail shops are moving away from hourly rates. They're moving to the flat rate system, which is what technicians get. And this sometimes can be where a lot of people think that dealerships are cutting corners from the detail. And don't get me wrong, because there's a ton of them that still do. I've worked at several dealerships throughout my career. Um, so when you're trying to get that perfection, and you're trying to do everything that you need to do in that short amount of time to be on flat rate, you have to be fast. So one of the things I recommend is a tool cart. You have everything right there by your side. You can grab it and go, or set it right in the center of the car on the console. It's gonna make it a lot faster. Also record yourself. Watch yourself during the day to see what you're spending the most time on. Are you spending too long washing? Is there something you can do to speed that up? Are you spending too long vacuuming in the car? Are there tools you can get to speed that process up? An awesome benefit is paid training. Last year, the dealership that I worked for paid me to come here. They paid for all of my IDA training. They paid me while I was here. And they paid for my food, which was awesome because I love to eat. <laughs> um, you're also going to get to learn the business side of that. So, a lot of these are going to apply to people that are just starting out, or maybe you detail part time and you have another job. Getting into the dealership is awesome, especially if you can get into the management portion. And the reason is you're going to learn about profit and loss. You're going to learn about um, labor times and you know how much costs per ounce, how much everything costs utilities, rent, things like that. You're basically going to get to run the business without spending any of your own money, which is even more fun. Um, marketing, all the various different types of advertising, it's all going to be paid for. You don't have to pay for any of it. So you get to use that as a learning experience. Let's say you want to try to use Facebook and you want to pay for ads. Well, when you work at a dealership, they're going to pay for them. That's not going to come out of your pocket. And those of you that currently use Facebook, you know it can get very expensive if you're not targeting the proper way. Also, if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I purposely make this a little bit shorter just so we can cover the questions. So now the downsides of dealership work, which these are the ones that most people are familiar with. These are the ones we hear about. It's very fast paced, which means if you can't keep up in your flat rate, you're not making any money. Another way they'll pay is they'll pay you a salary or an hourly wage, but then they also pay by the piece, of the piece work. So a lot of places will do that. And if you're not keeping up, you're either not making money or they're gonna move on to somebody else. When people say that the dealerships are just hacking these cars apart, I can promise you they are not going to let somebody stay there if they're ruining cars. If they're doing that terrible job, they will get rid of them. Um, a lot of people think that these guys are there for years and years and years. It's just, there's a high turnover rate, that's all. Um, if you're ruining cars, I can be there, especially in my shop. You ruin any anything and try to cover it up or it's a continuous habit, you're not going to be there anymore. You're going to get really nasty vehicles, especially at tax time. This is going to give you great experience, especially when there's vomit, dog crap, and, you know, all that fun stuff. When you're looking at it and you're like, what the heck is this? And 
you're wearing gloves and respirators, you have no idea. Those are fun times. Those are what you need to do again. You're probably not going to make as much as being self-employed, and that's just being honest. If you're self-employed, you have a little bit more control over how much staff you need, how big you want to grow, and things of that nature. When I was on my own, this was this was where I struggled because we needed more people, but more people meant affecting my bottom dollar, and so we would just push and push and push, and we would be working 12, 13, 14, 15 hours a day. And it just didn't make any sense. So we made a lot of money, but was it worth it? Not really. That's why I'm not doing it anymore. Um, we already covered the hacks. You won't get to spend as much time making it perfect. This is where a lot of the dealership detailers get their bad name. So what I mean by that is we're not doing full-blown paint corrections 95% of the time. What the dealer wants is for that car to look good when it leaves the detail shop and sits on their lot. It's not because they don't care about the vehicle. They just have so many cars coming through that you have to be able to keep up, you have to be able to take it to look good. A lot of people think it's just the dealer, or the detailer, just trying to cut corners when it's not. So take it from the perspective of a private business owner, if the customer comes in and all they want is a single step with an all-in-one, that's probably what you're going to give them, unless you don't offer that service. But that's what they're paying for. You're going to simply say that they're not paying you to do a correction. Well, in the dealership world, it's the same thing. They're not paying you to do a correction. Now, some dealerships will. Mine is one of them, where we have different pay levels, depending on what you do. If you're wet sanding, if you're, you know, cutting the compound, you're doing two, three, four steps, or spread coatings. Some dealerships don't offer them. You won't get to interact with your customers. So that customer may come in and ask for a uh, full detail. Everybody has different words for full detail. Every single shop has a different menu for what their full detail is. It's never the same in my experience. So when that customer comes in, if they were somewhere else, you know, last year, if you do a full detail, that customer may be expecting something totally different. And then it looks bad on you as the detailer in the detail shop at that department because you had no idea what they were expecting because you never had the opportunity to talk to them because they were working with the service department and not you. If you do work in a dealership, I strongly suggest trying to make that transition where you're allowed to interact with the customer, schedule the appointments and things like that because it'll make a world of difference. So, this is another one I see in the forums all the time. How do you get into a dealership? How much to charge and what do they want? So this is a big one and I left the dealership to start my own. And I had to basically reteach myself, how am I gonna get that work? One of the benefits I had was because I was already working for dealerships, I knew a lot of people. Now, keep in mind, they're not going to spend what your typical customer is going to spend. What they will do is provide you with a solid, steady stream of work that's going to keep you busy in those winter months, in those slow times. So if you know somebody that works there, that's the best way to get in and start talking to them because it's going to be very, very lucrative for your business as long as you are both on the same page about what they're expecting. So what does the dealership charge the customer? This is a good way to find out what they're going to pay you before they even start. So, like for example, our shop charges, on average, between two and three hundred dollars for a full detail. That would be the full interior with one step. Nothing crazy. Just make that look good. When we do occasionally have to sublet workout, we're only paying one hundred and fifty bucks. Why? Because we're going to give them volume. If we're going to send workout, we're going to send them. 10, 15, 20 vehicles at once, or within a short amount of time. So see what the dealership charge for customers and basically subtract 20, 30%. That's what they're gonna be willing to pay you without arguing with you. When they do that, that's when you wanna walk the lot and get an expectation of what their detailers are doing right and what they're doing wrong, because this is how you're gonna make your money. 
So let's say you go to the dealership and the cars are all hollow, right? We're all used to hit them with a wool pad and compound. You can go in there and you can tell that dealer, hey, I will give you that same quality of work for 150 bucks or whatever it is in your market. It varies. I've seen more, I've seen less. So you walk the lot, you see squirrel paint, you see scraped up hubcaps or wheels that are chipping paint or headlights that are cloudy. You can go in there and offer to fix those services on their own. Or you can tell them, hey, I'll include it, but this is what I have to charge for those extra things. So this does two things for you. For one, it might get you a higher pay on that dealer work. The second thing is, if you don't get that dealer work right away, you may get the opportunity to where their detailer doesn't know how to do certain things, and they might remember you and call you and say, hey, you know, we have this problem, can you take care of it? I work for a dealership, and I have other dealerships bringing us cars on a regular basis from all around the area for various things from ceramic coatings to odor removal to special stain removals like blood and things like that. Just because their detailers don't know how to do it. I've had dealerships call me about they have a customer and they weren't happy with their brand new car, the paint wasn't right, they come to us. So you want to establish yourself as an area expert. And I know you guys probably heard that a lot in a lot of these talks to become an expert in your area. Doing those things for the dealership and going in and introducing yourself and saying, hey, these are the specialty services I can offer you, is going to help to make you that area expert. Another big one is offer to train their staff. Yeah, they're your competition in some ways, but at the same time, you can charge them to train them. It can be anywhere from a day to a week to two weeks, whatever you think is necessary. Talk to that sales manager, talk to that service director, principal, dealer principal, whoever you need to. Say, hey, I know you're not looking to set work out. It might be a small dealership. What is your detailer doing that he can use some help with? Show them your credentials. Show them that you're part of the IDA, that you're a certified detailer. Show them that you do these continuously trainings. It's going to help, and it's going to build your reputation. We do it all the time. We train, obviously, all our new hires. Our orders and a lot of tenants are in a separate building than us. They all come to us for a training program. We have a standard operating procedure. That's how we do it. So if you can get these dealerships and at least get in the front door with them, you can train them, and they're going to be like, oh, he's the expert. So whenever there's a question or they have a difficult vehicle, they'll call you. So what is a dealer expecting? The biggest issue is lack of communication. This is, I've had people message me and call me and I've seen it on forums where they say, hey, I went to the dealer and I don't know what to charge them. I would charge a customer, you know, 1500 bucks, I did a full paint correction on this. And I'm always like, you, you didn't ask them what they wanted to pay or tell them what you were gonna pay. And then they complain they don't get paid. Well, yeah, because they had no idea that you were going to charge a thousand times markup what they charge for detail. You have to talk to them. You have to know what they're paying or they're willing to pay. You have to explain to them what you're going to get. You will lose a dealer so fast if you start sending them huge bills for stuff that you think is worth more than what they paid for. So find out what their expectations are. And the best way to do this is to walk a lot with them. Introduce yourself. Tell them who you are. Ask them if they have a few minutes. And just walk around the lot, look at the cars, see how they are, ask them if they're happy, see what their concerns are. So if they say, well, you know, the guys, they're not getting in between the seats, or they're not cleaning the wheel wheels right, or the door jams. Now you know in the back of your mind what that dealer's expecting. Ask them about the paint, look at the paint. Does it just need a one step? Or does it actually need a correction? Are they willing to pay for that? Or can you hide it? You need to have a fast turnaround. When we started getting proficient doing our dealer work, we would have somebody come in later in the day. Usually it was me or my wife. And we would work late in the night or on the weekends to do this dealer work. They would send us a bulk amount and we would spend that extra time doing it so that they could have a two or three day turnaround. I don't know if it's like this everywhere, but in our area, the, the used vehicles expected to lose $200 in value every day at sets before they send it to the auction. They do not typically keep cars more than 30 days and they ship them out if they're not sold. 
So if you can't give them that turnaround, they're not going to stay with you. They're going to go to another shop. So how can you combat this? You can hire somebody at minimum wage as an apprentice to go through and prep the vehicles. They can wash them, detar, vacuum them, you know, all the basic stuff. And then you can go through and fine tune it, and then you're still making money. Provided you're not paying them, you know, twenty, thirty dollars an hour. A lot of these new details think they need to make fifty dollars an hour because they see other shops charging that, but what they don't realize is that's your shop labor rate, not your hourly rate labor rate. You have overhead to cover. So watch what you're paying them. Do not pay them too much, but give them the opportunity to make more based on what they do. So if they do a certain amount of cars, they get a bonus. You have to give them an incentive, and then you'll be able to keep up with that demand. So production and profitability. This is good for both the dealership and the private detail shop. So last year I created a standard operating procedure, which I should have did a very long time ago. Because what would happen is the detailers would come in, they'd have their own way of doing things, and we'd have all of our products just out and available, and they'd use whatever they wanted. We were all doing something different. We'd all start out a vehicle in a different place, and when you only have one wash bag, that creates a problem. Everybody needs to get in there at the same time because nobody starts on something the way they're supposed to. So with that standard operating procedure, you can tell your detailers, hey, we're gonna start at point A, we're gonna go to point B, and this is how we're gonna finish. And if the wash bag's taken, this is the steps you take. When you do that, you're creating a foolproof way to make sure that car is done the same time every time. When someone comes into your shop, they should go, you detailed it, or what are your guys detailing? It should look the same every time when that vehicle leaves. So this is where I say utilize all-in-one type of polishing weapons, mostly for dealer work, or if you want for that full detail package, like we do. When a customer comes in, that's what they're getting, and we make it clear to them, this is gonna make your paint very glossy, very shiny. It's gonna take some scratches out, but not all. And then they have options from there if they want to pay more. This eliminates a lot of the miscommunication. This eliminates the need for my employees having to figure out what to use and when to use it. They can simply look at our whiteboard, say, okay, this is what the car is getting, and they can go to work. When you use those all-in-ones, you're also going to make the dealership happy because for one, you're cutting down on the cost of the product. You're not using three, four different things on the vehicle. It's going to save time and it's gonna save everybody the automation. So, sorry, I lost my spot. Um, I always say to invest in your own tools. I know that I said dealerships will provide, you know, different you know, polishers and things like that. What they won't do is change those rules every time a new one comes out. So, if you find yourself wanting the, the Rupa's hybrid, or the new flex that came out, the dealership's not gonna buy that, they're not gonna see need for it. You might, because it might speed it up. If you have everything on the cart that, you, that we talked about earlier, everything on your detailing cart, you can just grab it and go, you're not changing back and plates and all that. So if it makes sense, buy it. If there's tools they won't buy, like the Torner doors, buy it. I don't know if anybody uses them, but they've cut our carpet cleaning time in half, just in back just to break everything up in it. The other part about the standard operating procedure is to not jump to multiple parts of the vehicle. The guy that I'm trading right now, when he started, he would blow the car out, vacuum it, then he would wash it, then he would go inside and he would do the windows and the dash or whatever, and then he would start buffing it again. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm faster this way. I said, no, you're not. So he's a great kid. We went over the standard operating procedure and told him how it should be done. He is twice as fast, if not more, than when he first started six months ago. Just because he follows that list, it does things the way that I tell him to do. Obviously, this is going to be different for everybody. I tell the detailers, you can do it your way as long as the end result is the same. If it's not, we're going to do it my way. So this is another good one, leadership. Whether you're running a detail shop at a dealership or you're running one on your own, this is key. If you don't have good leadership, you're not gonna have good employees. It doesn't matter how you look at it. Um, your attitude and actions have a direct effect on your team. If you come in and you're in a bad mood every day, your team's gonna be in a bad mood every day. 
And if they're not, they're going to be happy and annoying you because they're in bed. You want to work with the employees in teams. Sorry, I keep stepping away from this. You want to work with the employees as a team and individually. So I recommend getting together, you know, every couple months to just touch base, make sure everybody knows the end goal, what you're doing, why you're doing it. And then in the instance of my newest employee, I had to help him one on one. And he got kind of flustered. He said, you know, I just, I, I don't know what I'm doing, maybe this isn't the job for me. I said, you're not doing this right because I'm not teaching you right. I didn't put the blame on him for not doing it right. I put the blame on myself because I was the one that hired him. I saw it in him to do the job and then I didn't properly train him or I didn't explain it well enough for him to understand it. So if I give him too many directions at once, and just expect him to go out and do it, his learning curve might be totally different than the next guy. So I really had to work one-on-one with him. And I told him one night, I sent him a message, I said, listen, there's no bad teams, there's only bad leaders. And I'm gonna take ownership and we're gonna get you on track. And we got him sped up and everything's been great. You wanna be the example. So when you go to work, if you're screwing off, if you're coming in late, if you're leaving early, they're gonna wanna do the same thing. Even if you don't let them, they're gonna think it's okay. They're going to say, oh, I'm going to go home at 3 o'clock. If that's what you're doing, that's what they're going to think they do. And if you don't let them and you're doing it, they're going to just become upset. And they're not going to want to work there. I experienced this firsthand with managers that I've had before. They would just do whatever they want. They weren't doing any dirty deals. They were just sitting back and taking all the clean ones, making all the money, leaving early, coming in late, things like that. So when I was in the position to be a manager, I decided I was going to be like that. I will personally take the dirtiest vehicle willingly just to show you that for one, I'm not going to expect you to do anything I won't do. And that it can be done in an efficient manner and quickly. Because what you'll see is you get these vehicles and they're completely trashed and you just get this cloud of doom over your head. And it's like, oh no, this is going to take me too long. I'm never going to get it done. You just have to get in there and you just have to do it. And if you show them that a few times, you're gonna inspire them. They're gonna be like, oh yeah, I can do that. And they're gonna get super excited about detail on the car that maybe they weren't before. It's gonna get done and the customers are gonna love it. Another one is be the mentor you wish you always had. If your employees have issues, whether it's inside of work or outside of work, family related or not, they spend more time with you than they probably do their family. They're with you every day, a minimum usually of five days a week. Be there for them. If they're having issues at home, talk to them. I'm not saying you have to be their best friend and hang out with them, but you have to make them feel like somebody cares about them. If they feel like they're just another number, then they're gonna treat the job as just a paycheck. If you treat them like a person, they're gonna treat the job as a career. And I've seen it firsthand in multiple shops and for multiple employees. Um, I've seen managers who just bark orders and their way is the highway. They don't care if you had a bad day, you need to get in there and get it done. If one of my technicians is having a bad day, I'm gonna find a way to help them get through that day. Whether it's giving them something easier to do or having somebody help them or me personally helping them. It's gonna make all the difference in the world to them and they're gonna be more loyal to your company. Because let's face it, when you have your own job, one of the biggest fears is I'm gonna train this guy and he's gonna leave and he's gonna go over his own shop. There's a quote, and I apologize because I don't know who said it, but it's train them good enough that they will that they can leave, but treat them well enough that they don't want to leave. And fortunately, I work for a great company. They're not all like that, especially with dealerships. But we have that same model throughout the whole entire dealership, and literally every person there will not say a bad word. We've had employees leave for various reasons. It, they will not say a bad word about it. And it's just because we treat them like people. Don't treat them like a paycheck, that's the biggest thing. I'm sure most of you, when you were starting out, whether it was detailing or another job, that's how you were treated. There's a couple of books I recommend for anybody, no matter what your job title is or your profession. And the number one book is by Jocko Willink, yeah. and it's called Extreme Ownership. And if you haven't read that book or listened to the audio book, I highly recommend it. It's entertaining and he's just down to earth and that's where I learned the, the quote of there's no bad teams, there's only bad leaders. And just from listening to that book, it changed my outlook and honestly it kind of changed my life. 
because I learned that I need to treat people differently and I need to look at situations differently. Is something going wrong and I'm blaming everybody else in the situation or do I need to blame myself and take ownership of that and find a way to fix it myself? And that's been my biggest takeaway in all of my management experience. And I think it will definitely help your company. So that's all I have for the slides. Um, questions. I know everybody always has questions, but um, would you would you say it's a good idea to turn up to dealership with, with your price list to try to get support? And if if, if, the, if, if that's the case, who would be the point of contact that you would um, have the reception? Some dealerships are different. Some of them the service manager or service director will take care of all the details. Other times it's gonna be the sales manager. Generally speaking, the the dealership principal or the general manager are not going to have anything to do with it if somebody starts going over numbers. So you want to find out who's in charge. So maybe talk to the salesman if you don't know, just to get your foot in the door, or just ask, say, who's in charge of the detail? Um, when you do that, as far as you're talking about the price list, you this is where you use the dealership tricks against them. Okay? We've all seen cars that are on sale, right? They're not really on sale, they just make room for them to give you a sale. So when you go in there, bump your prices up. Don't go crazy, 10% or something. So that when you start negotiating, because they're always gonna negotiate with you, you have that leverage, you have that growth. But it's also gonna give them a fair outlook of what they're looking at, so they can say, no, that's that's not what we're looking to pay, or we can't do that, or whatever. It's gonna be that cushion. Next. How do you approach getting paid on time? So, I went through this when I was on my own. This was a fun one because I personally knew everybody at this specific dealership because I worked there before. I actually left there on my own. So what I did is, most dealerships are gonna to wanna to pay you every 30 days. Some will pay you bi-weekly, some weekly, but most of my experience is gonna be 30 days. So what I did is a week after that 30 days, I became a bill collector. I was calling them, I was writing late charges on their invoices and personally taking them to them. They only didn't pay me on time one time. I gave them a $35 late charge. I never had the issue again. Um, so, but you gotta slow that up front, don't you? Agree? Yeah, if you're if you're gonna say, hey, you know, if you don't pay, you're gonna have this late charge. But but on the opposite side, you have to ask them, you know, how do you pay? How do you invoice? Because a lot of companies do it monthly to all of their distributors as far as like products and things like that. They just they're accounting. That's that's how they do it. So. If the particular person that you're working with doesn't know, just uh, check with the human resources department and someone in there will be able to tell you. Next question. Uh, dealerships and cultures, uh, what, what are the chances to, to bypass their, their own certified cultures? Is there a So this gets kind of tricky because for a lot of you, obviously we know, you know transparency just came out and that was so we can sell warranties to our detail clients. Well, dealerships operate kind of the same thing when it comes to their coatings, and I don't even want to call them coatings because they're just not. Um, for example, our dealership has one, and it's a, a spray that we rinse off, and it's basically a sealant. If you understand the chemistry, you know what it is, it's not terrible. The problem is, is a lot of times the dealership's not explaining to anybody, hey, you have to maintain it this way, it's gonna be reapplied this much, they're taking their money, and that's that, they don't need to find credit for work. Warranty's void in a week. If you do some weird wash ritual, candles, and things like that, who knows? Um, so the best way to do that is offer to maybe explain to the dealer principal, this is where they come, explain to them what the difference is between what you're offering and what they have. And I just went through this, we just started offering products about a year and a half ago. True, legit products, not the stuff they sell. They still sell theirs because they're not buying that product. They're, they're sealants and their coatings. Most of the time, they're getting that for free. When they sell the warranty, the company gets some money. So that's why they don't want to do it. They're also having their lot technicians do it in 15, 20 minutes out the door and it's done because time is money. So the way you want to approach it is you want to explain the difference. Start with, hey, I know you have some higher end vehicles or some more expensive vehicles, and people really care about those, and I think this would be a good option for you. 
So explain to them the difference in your product. Maybe let some dry so it's in little crystals and bring it in and show them. Maybe cover a hood for them for free on something so you can show them. Don't do any of those stupid crazy tricks like spray painting that because they do that themselves and there's tricks to it. Um, I've made videos for them with their products and I know the tricks to make the video do what you want it to do. So my, my best thing is just show them examples, explain that it's different. Um, whatever your process is, say I'll charge you this much and you're gonna wanna do it you know, a little bit cheaper, but let them make the cushion so that they're making money too. Um, honestly, dealerships are super hard to get into with cookies. You'll get a few, your best bet for that is to talk to the salesman directly and say, hey, I'll give you 50 bucks for every photo you sent me. And just completely bypass the finance department. You're gonna get a lot more, especially if you have some way of offering financing like Square. Um, we don't personally do that, but if you have that option, do that. Uh, the, the best route is gonna be get with your local like Rhino Liner or Linex dealer or you know, somewhere that does aftermarket stuff and undercoating and protection that doesn't offer anything for the paint. That's gonna be your best bet. We do a lot of business with Linex where it completely cuts off the dealership. They're going to them with their bed liner and their undercoating, and then they're saying, hey, what do you got to pay? Now they're calling us, hey, we're doing our undercoating this day, can you do a coating and get it back to us by the weekend? Yeah, no problem. That's gonna be your best bet. You're gonna get a lot more out of them than you will the dealer, but you may get the dealer. I'm fortunate that the current shop I'm at now, we are a separate building, we're not in the same, we're, dead, we're actually down the street, we're not even attached to the dealership and we're the more premier, so to speak, detail shop in the area. We do things the other shops don't offer, like coatings and things like that. And the, the dealer principal is a young guy, he's not shoulder with me, and he likes money. And he looks at it as a completely separate entity from the dealership, basically. So he's more into doing that, but a lot of dealerships, everything is self-contained, and that's why it's so hard to get into them, because they're looking, okay, I gotta pay my technician this much, or I gotta pay this guy this much, and that's where he goes now. So go in and off and do it on the higher end vehicles. Still let them make some money just to get in the door. If you have cheaper options like a one year coating or a two year coating, those are probably gonna be your better bet. There's some people out there that coat all of the dealership cars. They do it super cheap and they make a ton of money. So there's ways to do it, but it is difficult, I'm not gonna lie to you. It took me a year just to convince them to let me do it where I'm at. And now we do quite a few of them. Yes. I think dealers are seeing it on. Exactly. Um, one of the things is they think that you're competition. So make them think you're part of the team and explain to them, hey, we can both make money here. There's plenty of opportunity. This is what your customers want. If you're going to do this, a, a really good thing you can do is dealerships use special marketing. They use keywords, target words to get people's interest. You can do the same thing as a retailer. So with Facebook, they'll let you drop a pin on any address you want to advertise. Put your ceramic coating ads on all of their dealerships. When that customer's waiting to go into finance and they're scrolling on Facebook, they're seeing your ads for ceramic coatings. So now, that dealership's gonna start hearing about these ceramic coatings. They're gonna start being like, who's this guy? Why am I seeing his ads all the time going here? Well now, you go in there and you introduce yourself, and they're like, oh yeah, I've heard about you. Hey, here's how we can both make money. Everybody can make money at this, and the customer in the end is gonna be more happy. So that's a great way to basically make them aware that ceramic coatings are getting bigger. In my town, nobody really knew about ceramic coatings two years ago. It was, it was rare, they looked at me like I was crazy. Um, now it's pretty popular, we get some phone calls on it. People call us from other dealerships, hey, you guys offer this, our customers are asking for it. Because we're the only ones who do it. With the exception of uh, a chain dealership business. Anyone else? Yes. I'm sorry, what's that? There's actually several I could go on and on. Um, I recommend all of the Jack and Willink books. Another one is, uh, I can't think of the name of it now. Let me see if I write it down here. Probably not. Oh, it's um, You Can't Hurt Me. 
by David Goggins. That's what it is. I wanted to say Goggins. And while that's not actually a book about business, it's a book about not giving up. So whether you're just starting out or you're in a difficult place, that'll keep you inspired. That guy's nuts. If anybody doesn't know who he is, he's a retired military. He has all these records for pull-ups and marathons and, and crazy stuff. So it's definitely definitely worth a read or listen. Anybody else? Nobody? Going once, two, three times? All right. Thank you guys for coming. It was my first presentation here, so yeah. I was a little nervous, but you guys did great.